Go, bees, go. The battle cry of champions, the Penticton bees, world hockey champions. This is their story and the story of their mission, which they flew 6,000 miles to fulfill, to regain for Canada her prestige in the hockey world, to bring back the World Hockey Championship. Yes, this is the story of the Penticton Bees. Their destination was Krefeld, Germany, a city they had never seen, and many of them had never heard of. Krefeld, the home of the biggest silk and cloth industry in the world, the center of the Engineering Institute of Germany, and the headquarters of the World Hockey Tournament. Krefeld is not a large city, nor is it particularly well known, but for a short period of time, it held the attention of every sports fan on three continents. You get pretty tired after a 6,000 mile plane trip and your skating suffers too. So the first thing to do is get some practice to regain your skating and hockey ability. So they practice, skate and practice. They want to be in top shape again when this tournament starts. They had to win this one. All the players are conscious of a sense of pressure. They haven't gotten the jitters yet, but the feeling of responsibility causes the stomach muscles to tighten. Every game is important. So it's important that they make their plans carefully. You can't take any chances in a tournament like this. the men they had to beat, the present world champions from Russia, supremely confident and ready, ready to defend their title against all comers. They had beaten the Canadians last year and were determined to do it again. They'd been preparing for this tournament for a long time. They knew they faced stronger opposition from the Canadians, but felt they could again send them down to humiliating defeat. As an example of their supreme confidence, Bobrov, the Russian captain and star, watches the practice from the stands. After all, they've had 10 months of concentrated drill for this tournament. It was a full-time duty for them. which officially open the tournament are impressive. The music is nice to listen to, and all the athletes from all the countries enjoy it. The speeches, however, give the V's a new idea about things. This is more than just a hockey tournament. It's a certain political significance to it, too. Suddenly, it seems they're being put on the spot. The words of the Lord Mayor of Krefeld, then the chairman of the German Hockey Association, the president of the International Hockey Association as well, the chairman of the organizing committee. All these indicate to them there's a bigger job to do than they realize.
Well, the speeches and the music are over. Now it's time to get down to hockey business. Their first opponents, the United States team. And as the captains meet at center ice, that knot in the pit of the stomach begins to tighten. Canada scores early and often in this game, and Bill Warwick, the leading point producer of the series, gets the first of his six goals against the U.S. team. Brothers Grant and Dick set up the play. Score at the end of the first period with additional goals by Doug Kilburn and Jim Fairburn is Canada 3, USA nothing. The Americans break their scoring famine in the second period when defenseman Dan McKinnon gets their lone goal. But Canada comes roaring back with five counters. And Bill Warwick, camped in his favorite spot just outside the crease, scores number one on a backhander. Third goal by Bill Warwick, Jack McIntyre second, and one by defenseman Hal Torella, combined to give Canada an eight to one lead at the end of the second period. During the final 20 minutes, Doug Kilburn gets his second goal, and then Bill Warwick produces a third period hat trick. Brothers Grant and Dick, and the rest of the boys add their congratulations for six goals in one game by Bill Warwick. Dusseldorf to meet Czechoslovakia, a team a lot of people think will give them trouble. They've heard of Dusseldorf, one of the most bombed cities of Germany during the last war. Today, Dusseldorf is regaining its place in the affairs of the country. Trade fairs resumed, art exhibitions, banks are functioning, and the steel and iron industry for which the city is famous is again providing materials so vital to Germany's rebuilding program. All this they discover in their travels. But right now, there's a tough opponent to meet. The pressure is beginning to build. Figured in advance to be one of the toughest tests of the tournament, the game against the strong Czech team immediately proves to be just that. The captains meet at center ice, the customary handshake and exchange of each country's flags. Jack McDonald in the early minutes of the game, his blazing shot to the upper corner of the net gives Canada a one to nothing lead. You'll note that Canadian goaler Ivan McClelland is at his very best during the first period and he turns aside many difficult shots. Here's McDonald again. This time he does a nose dive over the Czech goalie.
Score at the end of the first period. Canada won. Czechoslovakia, nothing. The Czech team forces the play in the early minutes of the middle session. It finally pays off when Bubnik scores the tying goal. But deflected into the net off one of the Canadian players. Canada won, Czechoslovakia won. coach in a collision with Danda. He's temporarily winded, has to leave the ice for a well-deserved rest. And after the game, the Czech captain, Vladimir Zabrodsky, broadcasting to his homeland, called it the turning point of the whole series, suggesting that if Warwick had not been able to continue, the ultimate result might well have been different, and the Czech team might have won the World Hockey Championship. to end action on both sides continues to be fast and furious and the goaltenders at each end of the ice surface are called upon for many great saves. In the opening minutes of the final period, the Czechs take the lead for the first time. There's Vidraw going down left boards. His pass to Zahartsky, and the Czech captain makes no mistake with a sizzling backhander. Czech leads Canada two goals to one. things up for Canada, we turn once again to an old familiar figure, Bill Warwick. Al Torella starts the play from his own defense zone. McDonald, Kilburn, the pass out from behind the net. Bill drives it home. And look at those teammates almost smother him on the ice. The game tied again, two goals apiece.
couple of minutes of red-hot action, during which time the goalies come through in great style, the tide of battle changes again. For the second time in the game, Canada will find itself trailing by a single goal. Once again, the villain of the piece is the Czech captain Zabrudski. Scores on another pass by Vitro. And Czechoslovakia is in front. Three goals to two. They're happy boys. But there's the reason Canada really shows why it's the class of the tournament. Three goals in less than ten minutes. Jack McIntyre to Grant Warwick. And although the puck barely rolled across the line, it did. And the score is three goals apiece. Good Kevin Conway started that one from behind his own goal to McDonald again. Jack flew down those left boards, set up a perfect pass appropriately enough for playing coach Grant Warwick. Doug Kilburn, final count, Canada five, Czechoslovakia three, and the boys mob Ivan McClelland in the Canadian goal. game against Czechoslovakia was a tough one, but they won it. Now they relax just a little, meet some of the people from home, the fellows who are telling the folks how they're doing in this tournament, fellows like reporters and sportscasters. The weather is good, they stand around outside their hotel. They wish they had more time to look around. There's a lot to see in Germany, but they can't really enjoy it too much right now. They've got other things on their minds. Russia is playing Czechoslovakia, which gave Canada so much trouble. And naturally, the Canadian boys wonder how that game's coming along. This one could well be called the controversial game of the entire tournament. Neutral observers were in accord that the Czechs outplayed the Russians in all but one department. That was a mighty important one. They skated faster, set up their plays in superior style, but when it came to shooting, their efforts were woefully weak and misdirected. And on the few occasions he had to make a stop, the Russian goalie, Pochkov, had little trouble. The Czech team wearing the dark jerseys, the Russians slightly lighter in color with the white stripe across the shoulders. After single goals in the first and second periods, Russia came through with two more in the final 20 minutes. There's Babich looking for the rebound for the last one. 
indicative of the spirited action during this game is a double spill involving two Russian players close to the Czech goal. Bobrov was upended and Babic pinned against the goalpost. Almost immediately after, Babic rams hard into the end boards, but after brief treatment, is able to get on his feet and he stays in the game. Final score, Russia four, Czechoslovakia, nothing. Canadian reporters waste no time getting an interview with the Russians to see if they can spot anything wrong. Everybody seems to think the Czech players did not give their best against the Russians, and they want to know why. But there's more hockey to be played, and they put everything else aside. Finland and Sweden are next. is not expected to have too much trouble, but the underdog shows its teeth in the early minutes, and even Lady Luck took a hand when Jack McIntyre hit the post from close in. again. He's an unhappy boy. Finally, it's up to defenseman Hal Torella. Comes all the way down from his own corner. Passes to Grant Warwick. Over to McIntyre, but the Finnish goaler made a great save. And a rebound. It's Torella with a high hard one to the upper corner. Canada leads Finland one to nothing. not to be outdone by his teammate on the Canadian defense line, Captain George McAvoy makes it 2-0 with a blast from 30 feet up. goaltender as Dick Warwick, Kilburn, Berry, Bathgate, and McDonald combine to make the scoreboard read Canada 7, Finland nothing at the end of the first period. In the middle session, Canada shows its ability to keep the puck inside the opponent's defense zone. Time after time, Finland clears it down the ice just to relieve the pressure. Warwick adds two goals to his rapidly mounting points total. Jim Fairburn gets one. His came on a fine pass out by Jack McIntyre, who assisted on three of Canada's goals. There's McIntyre again. This time his pass is to Bill Warwick. It's 10-0 for Canada at the end of the second period.
Even with a commanding lead, Canada applies the pressure throughout the final period, and the Finnish goaler, Svensson, is called upon to make many saves of a sensational nature. once again. Not only Svensson for Finland, but McClellan for Canada. McClellan has his heart set on another shutout. He's getting closer every minute. It's impossible for one man to hold off the Canadian attack. McIntyre chalks up his third assist. Played one on Mike Chabaga's stick, and the veteran center got his first goal of the tournament. Another goal is added later to the Canadian total by Dick Warwick. As the Finnish team, game as they come, and with a great goaltender in Svensson, finally goes down to defeat. Final score, Canada 12, Finland nothing. Canada meets Sweden. According to pre-tournament calculations, Sweden is likely to give Canada a tough time. This proves to be true, as the Canadians, after running up scores of mountainous proportions, are able to score just single goals in each of the three periods. Ivan McClelland. Defenseman Hal Torella scores for Canada in the first period. Then it's Jack McIntyre, a second period goal after a fine combination play. Besides holding down the high-powered bees, Sweden has an attack of its own. Ivan McClelland has his busiest night for some time. Nice assistance from four players on that particular case. The final goal of the game, Grant Warwick in the last period, is something of a switch from the usual routine, Brother Bill supplied the assist that time. The Swedish attack is very much in evidence once again. McClellan continues to be brilliant in the Canadian nets. But Canada shows it can put on the pressure too. Although their team is trailing by three goals, a group of fans from Sweden never gives up. Their cheer is designed to give their favorites a lift. But cheers alone don't help, and the Swedes find it difficult to get out of their own end of the ice surface. The customary post-game lineup. Congratulations all around.
And the final score, Canada three, Sweden nothing. The Canadians still unbeaten. And now they move to Cologne to meet the team representing Germany. They're not too worried about this game because the German team has not shown much strength throughout the tournament to date. However, every game is important and you can't take any chances. They find the Cologne Stadium is very impressive. First members of the German team and then Canadian players take the ice, led by goalie Ivan McClellan, brothers Dick and Bill Warwick, defenseman Kevin Conway and Hal Torella, forwards Jimmy Middleton, Mike Shabaga, little delay with Doug Kilburn, and finally defenseman Captain George McAvoy and forward Jim Fairburn. An exchange of flags between the captains, and then they get the final instructions from the officials. As the first period gets underway, there's plenty of end-to-end -end action and more body contact than European hockey fans are used to seeing. Canada runs up a 3-0 lead at the end of the opening period. Goals are scored by Bill and Grant Warwick and Jack McDonald. Canada scores again early in the second period as defenseman Jack Taggart, the last minute addition to the Canadian team along with winger Jim Middleton, gets his first of the tournament. And very shortly after that, Hans Huber, the German defenseman, scores his team's only goal with a hard high shot to the corner. Naturally, the German crowd loves that. There is Huber's goal. McClellan had no chance on a hard shot. Some very good stick handling here by playing coach Grant Warwick as he starts a Canadian power play. But he finds the German goaler continues to make some great stops. Here's Jim Fair sliding a pass right across the goal line. And almost immediately after, a Canadian goal is called back. Here's Dick Warwick, all by himself. Apparently scores it, he didn't hear the whistle. The German goaltender did and made no effort to stop the shot. second time thought it was in the net raised his arms in familiar fashion the puck was lodged on the outside of the netting
Jack McDonald on the clean breakaway. Pulled the goaler, scoring one of his two in the final period. puts his man down with a resounding thump. And seconds later, McIntyre has the loose puck, passes to Kilburn, and the husky little winger scores Canada's ninth goal. One more Canadian goal finished the scoring, and then, Flag goes up. And congratulations offered all around once again. Final score, Canada 10, Germany 1. And now that that one is over, the boys have a day to look around. The most interesting site is the famous Cologne Cathedral. During the war, when Cologne was the target for concentrated bombings by the Allied Air Forces, Cologne Cathedral almost completely escaped being damaged, although the buildings around it were demolished. The cathedral was founded in 1248 AD, and among its treasures are the shrines of the three kings of Cologne. The boys marvel at its size, and they spend hours examining it fully. This is what makes the tournament interesting. But while they're sightseeing, Russia is playing the United States. Throughout this game, which the defending champions win by three goals to nothing, the play of Don Regazio in the American net is definitely outstanding. On at least a dozen occasions, he kicks out shots that seem to be almost certain goals. checking by the Russians holds down the U.S. attack. They get very few shots on goal. When they do, Hotchkoff handles them easily. Gazio continues to do his stuff, you'll see one particular save, generally accepted by all observers as the most spectacular of the championships. How did you like it? Another reason why reporters and commentators alike gave the American goalie all-star recognition immediately after the tournament. Another case of a goal called back, the Russian captain Bobrov skated right in on Regazio, hadn't heard the whistle. The goalie made no effort to stop the shot.
Final score, Russia three, USA nothing. Well, the tournament is nearly over. There's only the big game left. The plans must be made for next year. And in the Park Hotel at Düsseldorf, the heads of the hockey associations meet to make the decision necessary. The question of where the tournament will be held in 1956 and again in 1957 has to be settled. And the pros and cons are discussed in detail. Outside the stadium in Krefeld, the cars and buses of the radio and television people form a solid line that stretches the length of the building. And inside, the crews make last-minute arrangements. They check cameras, microphones, lighting and cables. Nothing is left to chance. They're getting ready for the game of the tournament. This is the one they've been waiting for. The game that will decide the world championship. Will Russia retain it, or will Canada get it back? That's the question, and all around the world, sports fans are waiting anxiously to find out. Yes, this is the big game. The game they flew 6,000 miles to play. All the others, just preliminaries. And here's the Russian team coming on the ice. Last minute instructions from the two referees, Müller and Hauser from Switzerland. The two captains, McAvoy for Canada, Bobrov for Russia. And now the first face off, McIntyre at center for Canada against Shubalov for the Russians. The first shot of the game by Bill Warwick. It goes wide and Pochkov clears it. In the first period, the Canadian forward line of Mike Shabaga, Jim Middleton, and Jim Fairburn is outstanding. And they're responsible for the first goal. Middleton from the Russian blue line to Fairburn behind the net, out to Shabaga, and he scores. The crowd, to say the least, is enthusiastic.
Another play to bring the crowd to its feet. Here's Jim Middleton and great puck control. Down to one knee, fell flat, managed to get a pass away finally. Although there is no scoring in the first period after that one goal by Shabaga, action continues to be hot and heavy, and both goaltenders are forced to make fine stops. The end of the first period, Canada won, Russia nothing. Canada adds two more goals in the second period. Bill Warwick gets his first and his 14th of the tournament. Mike Shabaga scores his second of this all-important game. As a fine example of the tremendous work of Ivan McClelland in the Canadian net as he turned in his fourth shutout of the tournament, watch him as he makes what appears to be an almost impossible save. Here it is. And a great stop by McClelland. At the end of the second period, the scoreboard shows Canada three and Russia nothing. Early in the final period, Bill Warwick gives Canada a 4-0 lead. You'll see him sweep around the left side of the Russian defense, move in on goal, and although the space is small between the goalers' pads and the post, Bill hits the bullseye. There he goes, and he scores. And Mr. Warwick continues his now famous victory dance on ice. Here's a little game of cat and mouse between the Russian forward in possession of the puck behind the net and the two Canadian defensemen who are waiting for him to make the first move. Canada's fifth and final goal one that sends Russian net miner Pochkov to the showers, is scored appropriately enough 
by Captain George McAvoy. From behind his own blue line into center ice, and a long shot, Hutchcock doesn't even see. But the spectators now see a new man in the Russian goal, Mirtikhan, a jumping jack type who is successful in preventing Canada from scoring again. In spite of their five to nothing lead, there is no let up in Canada's spirited play. Dick Warwick knocks one man down, and within split seconds, Doug Kilburn does it again. Here's the sequence. There is undoubtedly much more body contact in this final period as both clubs keep up a fast pace. Shortly you'll see two incidents to bear out this fact. Here is case number one as Kevin Conway jams Kristoff against the boards and during the high sticking that follows, he next tangles with Kuchowski. Both men eventually get penalties. And defenseman Hal Torella, who in spite of handing out the stiffest body check seen during this tournament, Remarkably free of penalties until this particular play. He upset the Russian captain Bobrov. Our cameras caught it from both sides of the Greyfeld Arena. In spite of their one-man advantage, the Russians fail to press an actually serious attack. In fact, Bill Warwick comes mighty close to scoring again, much to the obvious dislike of the little Russian goaltender. There is no further scoring. Shortly after, it's the final whistle and Canada has defeated Russia five goals to nothing. Yes, they did. Canada is again champion of the hockey world. There are cheers, tears, and laughter. And there's a tremendous letdown. They shake hands with their opponents, yet they can hardly believe it's all over. The pressure is on. They accept the congratulations of officials and friends alike. The Russians look on, naturally, a little bit dejected. Following the official presentation of the trophies by Bunny Ahern, the lineup of all countries' flags, a very impressive sight. And a final look at the defeated champions from Russia. The two officials, Mueller and Hauser from Switzerland, 
who handled a fine game. A last handshake between Captain George McAvoy of Canada and Captain Bobrov of Russia. welcome. They step off the plane to be greeted by their wives, friends, and officials. And of course there are parades, excitement, bands, drum majorettes naturally, and even dancing in the streets as Penticton celebrates the return of their champions. seeking and found, their mission accomplished. They are truly the hockey champions of the world. 